Me tahuri tātou ki te kaupapa mato o te rānei, ki a tātou tangata hitore, uh, ki a Vincent O'Malley, uh, we have a whakatauki in Te Ao Māori. Ka mua, ka muri, it means walking backwards into the future, and I think it fits Vincent quite well. In fact, Vincent may have spent more of his time in the 19th century than the 20th and 21st combined, <laughs> and we're very grateful for that. So without further ado, Vincent. <laughs> Uh, New Zealand wars were a series of conflicts that profoundly shaped the course and direction of our nation's history. Fought between the Crown and various groups of Māori between 1845 and 1872, the wars touched um, many aspects of life in 19th century New Zealand, even in those regions that were spared actual fighting. And physical remnants or reminders from these conflicts and their aftermath can be found all over the country, whether in central Auckland, here in Wellington, Dunedin, or more rural locations such as Te Porere or Te Awamutu. Many New Zealanders, Māori and Pākehā, can probably trace descent from at least one, an one ancestor caught up in these wars. Some people have forbearsly fought on both sides. The wars are an integral part of the New Zealand story, but we haven't always cared to remember or acknowledge them. For much of the period since 1872, Pākehā have either clung to a highly romanticised version of these wars that emphasised mutual chivalry and heroism, was, but was devoid of more disturbing truths, or when that was no longer tenable, we simply ignored them altogether. But this is our story, our history. It happened here in this place, relatively recently in historical terms, and it had profound consequences for what New Zealand was and what it would become. And so that's why it's really important to remember this history today. To say that the wars are fought between Māori and the Crown is slightly misleading because, for one thing, Māori fought on both sides. As far as the Crown was concerned, Māori were either for it or against it. Neutrality, tempting though that might have been, wasn't really an option um, in these circumstances. So in desperate circumstances, Māori communities had to make life or death decisions to ensure the survival of their whanau and hapu. British Imperial troops did the bulk of the fighting on the Crown side before 1865. For the rank and file soldier, um, life in the British Army at this time was, was pretty tough. The pay was poor, living conditions were often squalid, and alcoholism was rife. The discipline was harsh, um, including brutal public floggings that sometimes left grown men who witnessed them in tears. And desertion, understandably, in, in these circumstances was widespread. Um, and just as loyalist Māori had their own reasons for fighting, so did a lot of those who fought um, in the British Army. The interesting thing here, um, Thanks to the work of Charlotte MacDonald, we know that up to two-thirds of the rank-and-file soldiers were Irish. Um, and as somebody of Irish Catholic extraction myself, I, I often wondered how did they feel about fighting a war of conquest and dispossession for the very same British crown that had used their country as a template for, for British imperialism? Short answer is a lot of those guys were literate, so they didn't leave behind a lot of letters and journals and diaries recounting their thoughts. But there's enough anecdotal evidence to suggest that a lot of them became increasingly disillusioned with the wars and they, they asked why they should be tasked with robbing Māori of their lands for the benefit of settlers in New Zealand. Why weren't, why weren't the Pākehā here doing the dirty work themselves? And at the very same time, British taxpayers were asking why should they be funding this war on the other side of the globe when, the, when it was, again, it was the settlers in New Zealand that were benefiting, not, not British taxpayers at all. So a lot of the troops um, sought their dis discharge in, uh, um, from the army in New Zealand. So the British army leaves in 1870, but a lot of the individual soldiers remained behind. Um, and a number of them actually end up um, marrying Māori women from the very same iwi that they've been fighting against. After 1866, colonial troops, um, including conscripted militia, volunteers, military settlers, uh, specialist units such as the Forest Rangers um, and the armed constabulary, along with their Māori allies, ex exclusively responsible for fighting on the Crown side. Uh, in settlements like Auckland and Wellington, all Pākehā men aged between the ages of um, 16 and 55 were liable to, to, to conscription, although lunatics, priests and members of parliament were exempt. <laughs> the Māori communities they fought against had no standing armies. They were a civilian population fighting in defence of their homes and their lands, um, with weapons in many cases that dated back decades, um, often without artillery or, or adequate ammunition. So, you know, the Crown had armour-plated steamers and Māori had wooden canoes. And in most of these conflicts, they're outnumbered three or four to one. 
So really, um, in these circumstances, just, to, just surviving is quite miraculous in some of these conflicts. Land sovereignty and lurking Victorian assumptions of racial dominance were all factors in these wars. Um, an overarching theme of all of the conflicts um, was a tension between increasing Crown assertions of unbridled sovereignty and Māori expectations of, con of continuing chiefly authority. And at their core, a lot of these conflicts raised the same question, whose will was going to prevail? And that was bigger than a question of land ownership, but went to the heart of how Māori and Pākehā would live together in this country. Would Māori share the same fate of many other Indigenous peoples around the globe, being reduced to a state of subservience and perhaps even facing a prospect of total extinction? Or was New Zealand somehow different? Would the promises held out in the Treaty of Waitangi be upheld by the Crown? Well, we not only know the answer to that question today, but we also live with the consequences in so many ways. The Native Land Court wouldn't have been possible without the New Zealand Wars. Neither would the Native School System. So one of these stripped Māori of their lands and the other of their language. Um, and this is an ancient history. We live with the consequences of that today. That you know, we, we are living the New Zealand Wars. Actual fighting might have ended in 1872, but the legacy of the wars continues to be felt in many ways. And awareness and knowledge of this historical context is crucial to fully understanding the present. Any discussion of contemporary Māori poverty that fails to acknowledge the long history of invasion, dispossession and confiscation is missing a vital part of the story. And similar connections can be made in, in a lot of different areas as well. You can't understand what's happening at Ihumatau without first knowing some of the, the, the history of the Waikato War of 1863-64, what Woodrow Tamihana described as the Great War for New Zealand. The rough and ready balance of power between Māori and Pākehā that had survived since before the treaty was signed in 1840 finally came to an end in the 1860s. Having assumed effective control over the country in accordance with their long-standing expectations of racial dominance, settlers weren't willing to share that with, with Māori. Instead, it was to be exercised for the exclusive, exclu exclusive benefit of Pākehā. And really, not until at least the 1970s did that begin to change in any kind of meaningful way. And the wars, of course, left Māori communities with deeply entrenched grievances, unanswered and largely un ignored for decades, that we're still un attempting to unpack and resolve today. So there's no need to run from our past, but nor, nor should we fear it. Understanding mutual respect and dialogue, actually talking about this history, I suggest will bring us together rather than tear us apart. And it's the basis for genuine reconciliation, not recrimination. And this doesn't require feelings of guilt or shame, just honesty and a willingness to confront these difficult topics. And I think maybe, just maybe, we're starting to turn a corner um, right now, and that's certainly not before time. Thank you.